It's nice to see that all of you have, have made it uh, through an entire week. You survived to the last day of classes, the Saturday, no less. And um, I hope that one thing you've picked up during the week is some good economist jokes. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard many. You may, maybe you know some already, like, for example, the, uh, an optimist is someone who sees the glass half full, a pessimist sees the glass has, half empty, uh, an economist only sees a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> you, you've learned also that uh, unlike uh, uh, some mainstream economists who view uh, money as the only motivator, uh, so think that people pursue only financial ends, financial goals, uh, you've learned this week that uh, in the Austrian perspective, people can pursue any objectives they want, whether they're material, immaterial, financial, non-financial. Uh, people can have any objectives they want in their preference orderings. They're not these sort of uh, uh, you know, money-oriented, uh, uh, narrow-minded uh, sort of calculating machines that are described by neoclassical economics, like, for example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the case where this... Uh, Truck driver is um, he's driving a delivery truck, and uh, there's a there's a young stockbroker in a brand new BMW parking, uh, parallel parking, and he opens the door to get out without looking, and this panel truck comes by and just smashes the door right off, and so the the driver of the truck immediately stops and runs over to see if he can help, and he's appalled by what he sees. The uh, not only has he taken off the uh, door, but he's also ripped off the driver's arm. So the guy's sitting there with, with no arm, and the truck driver runs up, and the, the guy's saying, oh, my BMW, my BMW. And the uh, truck driver says, hey, buddy, you know, forget about your BMW. Take a look at your arm. You know, he's got a stump, and there's blood spurting out. And the guy says, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> People are not really like that. Um, Okay, the, this morning's uh, topic is the economics of information technology. Um, I, I really want to be a little bit more general than that and talk about uh, the economics of innovation and technology more broadly. But most of the examples will come from the IT um, uh, information technology or IT sector. So just to give you some background, a lot of you have probably heard the term new economy. This is a term that was bandied about a lot, particularly in the latter half of the 90s. Uh, sort of the information economy, the internet economy. The, the, the idea was that something about, uh, uh, something about the, uh, the nature of um, economic activity was fundamentally different. Because we had all this technology, because we had the internet, e-commerce, etc., there was something really new and different going on, and therefore the old laws of economics no longer applied. And so you would see uh, 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 theoretical and policy debates among uh, economics and apply, uh, economists and applied economists saying, well, you know, do demand curves still slope down if you're talking about uh, you know, information goods as opposed to tangible goods? Um, do the law, basic laws of supply and demand still hold, for instance? Well, what are some of the things that people meant by that term new economy? Some, uh, some would use it in a macroeconomic sense, you might remember during the 90s, as is the case during almost every credit-induced uh, boom, you have prognosticators saying, well, this is really a permanent phenomenon. We, don't, we won't have business cycles anymore. Um, uh, the, the, you know, because of technology, because of the Internet, um, you know, these rapid growth rates will just continue and continue. Um, of course, we know that that's, well, we all know now that that's silly since the stock market crashed and the economy went into recession, uh, but also just um, uh, from, uh, on theoretical grounds, we know that as long as there's a Fed, there are going to be business cycles, whether, there's, uh, uh, whether we have e-commerce or not. I remember a conference I went to once where one of the speakers was um, a, an economist at one of the federal, regional Federal Reserve Banks, sort of a free market guy who is very knowledgeable on Austrian economics, even kind of considers himself to be sort of an Austrian, and he said, uh, well, he said, well, I'm so pleased to be here on this panel today speaking to you about business cycles, taking some time off from my regular job of creating them. <laughs> and that got a big laugh, but I was thinking, you know, that's really kind of sad. <laughs> but
about that. So, we, so, so that's silly. A lot of people in the media said, well, in, in the sort of old economy, output was based on you know, manufacturing tangible goods, and now it's oriented towards services. So the old economy was sort of you know, uh, uh, blue collar, the new economy is white collar. And again, this, this is not really a very meaningful distinction. Um, in the old economy, the, firm, uh, the value of firms was based on their tangible assets. Now, with the new economy, it's based on intangible assets. A company like Amazon, for example, that doesn't have much in the way of tangible capital, doesn't have much of a revenue stream, but has this high market value because of its reputation, because of the knowledge that its employees possess, and so on. Well, again, these are not um, terribly meaningful distinctions in terms of classifying an economy as old or new. Uh, they think these things have always been true. Um, uh, uh, firms produce... Tangible goods and intangible services always have. Um, intangible assets such as reputation have always been important. Think of uh, Professor Long's talk last night when he mentioned the medieval law merchant, uh, these private courts that would adjudicate disputes among merchants. The value of the product of that private court was based almost wholly on its reputation for fairness, trustworthiness, reliability, and so on. So reputation has always been an important asset. This is not something that was sort of created in the 1990s uh, with the birth of the Internet. Uh, some people have pointed to different forms of competition. They say, well, you know, in, in sort of a traditional economy, entrepreneurs compete by trying to produce the best goods and services at the lowest prices. But in the new economy, you compete differently. Um, firms cooperate with each other in new ways. Um, firms have to produce the sa a product that uh, has the uh, Products that are compatible, that are on the same standard, so they have to collaborate in ways uh, that they didn't before. Or that uh, firms will give away their stuff for free rather than sell it to consumers to try to lock in consumers to sell them some stuff in the future. And again, the claim is that this was some, uh, th that these forms of competition are brand new when, of course, um, they're, uh, they're, they're very old. During this time, a lot of people, as I mentioned, began to, began to argue that economic theory itself somehow had to change. That because of these new conditions, this new environment, we need a new set of economic principles. Again, supply and demand doesn't work. Uh, the law of diminishing returns doesn't hold anymore because you can produce software, as many copies as you want, at zero marginal cost, and blah, blah, blah. I want to get into those arguments in a little bit more detail, but try to convince you that, um, that none of these phenomena require a radical rethinking of economic theory. Okay, regular economics or regular Austrian economics, by which I simply mean Austrian economics, is just as, uh, applies just as much to these phenomena as it does to any other. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about tangible goods or so-called information goods. It doesn't matter whether network effects, sometimes called network externalities, are present. Uh, one of the names that you see in this literature is a uh, sort of a social theorist named Brian Arthur, um, who got a lot of press in the late 90s is at the, with the Santa Fe Institute in uh, New Mexico uh, claiming that uh, you know, sort of everything's turned inside out and uh, because of network effects, which I'll uh, dis uh, discuss in more detail in just a moment, um, we can no longer say that markets produce the goods and services that consumers desire. We have all kinds of weird, uh, I mean, these guys make these outlandish conclusions that, for example, that that the steam locomotive is really more efficient than the internal combustion engine, but we're sort of stuck in this inefficient path uh, where we have automobiles instead of steam-powered. We have internal combustion cars instead of steam-powered cars. Okay, um, <coughs> very briefly, what are some of the issues that come up with so-called information goods? Right, an information good simply means, just like it sounds, that the good or service being offered on the market is information rather than a physical thing. Okay, so it's not a piece of paper that's being sold. It's some information that's, in, that's written on that piece of paper. Um, again, that hardly seems like anything new. Uh, people have been selling information as long as we've had economic exchange. Um, but, but a lot of writers have claimed that, well, we have these really perverse sort of market phenomena when you're talking about information goods. For example, um, Firms will offer slightly different versions of the same thing as a form of price discrimination. Um, you, know, uh, uh, um, you know, Adobe Acrobat is an example. 
right? So the Adobe Acrobat Reader is given away for free. The basic version is given away for free or at nominal cost. The deluxe version is given away at a higher price, you see, or sold at a, at, a, at a higher price. You see this is very common in software. It is, well, this is a form of price discrimination. Once the product is produced, it's easy, or the, the, the producer can make slightly different versions of the product at, uh, with, without much retooling. You don't have to retool an assembly line. You just change a few lines of code, and therefore you can more uh, precisely segment the market according to willingness to pay, and you'll see multiple versions of products flourish. Okay, that's an interesting competitive phenomenon. It doesn't really have any uh, policy implications. Um, firms will value customer loyalty more than they did before. Um, uh, sell, sellers of um, information goods such as software or directory listings will try to um, sort of lock customers into that one particular product by encouraging and developing customer loyalty, rewarding people who use that product frequently, um, establishing a, a reputable brand uh, that will encourage future uh, patronage and, and so on. You might have heard the term vaporware, where companies are alleged, allegedly announce a new product that they're going to be bringing to market in the near future when they really never intend to bring a new product to market just to keep customers who are using their current product from switching to some rival, right? So Microsoft, for example, will say, well, we're, we're about to introduce a new version of Word. It's just down the road so that current users of Word won't switch to WordPerfect. It's like, oh, I'll wait until the new version of Word comes out, uh, when in fact, you know, the company never really intends to uh, offer a new product, but it's just doing this as sort of a, a deceptive uh, practice. Again. It's true that when competing in these kinds of markets, because the production process, the process by which software is produced, is different from the process by which uh, automobiles are produced, right? High fixed costs, low variable costs, low marginal costs. Once you produce the operating system, you can produce, you, once you write it, you can produce additional copies at very low marginal cost. Implies that firms will have different, different pricing strategies different strategies for releasing the product and so on. Again, there's nothing sort of nefarious or suspicious about this, uh, um, and there's, there's nothing that calls for a radical revision of the way we think about markets. So sort of the bottom line is, you know, when you, when you think about markets for software or markets for, uh, you know, a search engine or markets for a directory listing, yeah, they do have some slightly, they have some interesting and perhaps slightly unusual characteristics relative to markets, you know, for pencils. Um, but that doesn't mean the, re the, the our sort of uh, standard economic tools and concepts don't apply because they do just as much as before. And again, the point is none of these phenomena are really new. Um, I saw a paper not too long ago uh, that uh, studied the competition among different providers of Yellow Pages directories uh, in the 1960s. And it turned out that this, ha these, this market had exactly the... This competition took exactly the same form as competition we've seen in the last two or three years between, you know, Yahoo and Google, or between d companies that are offering different, uh, you know, sort of listings of things. So the idea of selling information to people rather than selling them goods and services is, you know, as old as, as commerce itself. Okay, more specifically, I mentioned, I mentioned something called networks before, or network effects. Um, you sometimes hear the term network externalities. What is that and what does it have to do with anything? The reason network effects are important is because they underlie or underlay the main arguments that were used in the antitrust case against Microsoft, which is worth talking about briefly because it's influenced um, a lot that's happened in the software market in the last few years. Um, as you know, Microsoft was investigated several times, is still under investigation by the European Union antitrust authorities, and is currently operating under the terms of a consent decree, a decree that was um, signed two years ago um, from its last case, three years ago from its last case that was settled in 2001. Um, what, what the heck is going on? Why, why is the government always going after Microsoft? Why are various governments always attacking Microsoft? Well, the main case against Microsoft, in a nutshell, was that Microsoft's you know, dominant share of the market for desktop operating systems was not earned you know, fairly through market competition. 
It wasn't that consumers really preferred Microsoft's products to someone else's products, but rather Microsoft took advantage of this sort of sinister phenomenon called network effects or network externalities and some other you know, so-called anti-competitive practices. Well, what does this mean? Um, what is a network effect anyway? Um, a network effect refers to, and this is actually something that uh, Professor Long brought up in his talk last night as well. A, a network effect describes the process by which the value of a particular good or service to you as a consumer depends on how many other people are also using that good or service. So, you know, take, for example, an instant messenger program, right? The value of having an instant messenger program on your computer depends on how many of your friends also have instant messaging, right? I mean, if you're the very first person in the world to have an instant messaging client, no one else in the world has it, you know, what are you going to do with it, right? In other words, the value of the product increases with the size of the network. So we say there is a network effect present. Um, Okay, so what? Well, the argument, uh, the, the, the alleged problem is the following. When you have network effects, or in markets with network effects, it is alleged, the best technology may not win in market competition. Okay, the best product may not actually win out in the battle among products or services for consumer patronage. Right? For instance, use this instant messaging example. Right, suppose there are two instant messenger products on the market, you know, uh, AOL's instant messenger AIM and say Yahoo Messenger. And let's assume they're not compatible with each other. Right, so if you have AIM, you can only exchange messages with other people on AIM. And same thing with Yahoo. Okay? Yeah. <coughs> so let's say, you know, you're, uh, you're a new customer in this market. You're, you're thinking, assume that you have to buy these things, right? You're thinking about buying an instant messaging program. And let's say that, you know, there are 100 people on, that currently use AIM, and there are 100 people that currently use Yahoo Messenger, right? And let's say that you don't really care which one you use in terms of the features and all that. You just want to be able to contact as many people as possible. So you say, well, there's 100 people on AIM, there's 100 people on Yahoo Messenger, so I don't really care. You know, maybe you flip a coin. So let's say you flip a coin and it comes up heads, so you purchase uh, AOL's product. Okay, so now someone else comes along after you and, and is trying to make the same decision. But now notice there are 101 people on AIM and 100 people on Yahoo Messenger. So this person thinks, well, I'd rather be on the larger network, so I'll go ahead and get AIM as well. Right now there's 102 people and 100. Right, and you get the idea. Each person that comes along afterward will, continue, will, will buy the, uh, purchase the AIM product because it gives, gives you access to a larger network. Right, so eventually, some, some period in the future, you know, AIM has almost all of the customers. Yahoo just has its original 100, or maybe they start switching over to AIM because they want to be on the larger network too. So the idea is, you know, what, what was it that made AIM win in this competitive process over Yahoo? It wasn't that AIM offered a superior product. It was just, it was luck, right? It was just pure chance. It was a coin flip. Could have gone either way, just happened to go, uh, to go one way. And because of the network effect, that product ended up being the dominant product or service, ended up taking control of the whole market. This phenomenon by which the network effect leads one product to dominate the market is sometimes called path dependence. <coughs> path dependence, what that means is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the constellation of goods and services that prevails on the market today is a function of the choices that people made yesterday, which is a function of the choices that people made the day before that. Right, so assuming that there are some costs to switching from one product to another, you, know, you use AIM because somebody else chose to use AIM in the past, and that's because someone else chose to use it in the past, and so on. The idea is we can kind of get stuck on one particular path and we can't switch out of it, right? Like say you discovered one day, oh my gosh, the Yahoo product is really a better product. Now look, they've introduced some new features that would offer more value than the features that the AIM offers. You know, let's switch. But the problem is no individual is going to switch from AIM to Yahoo 
because then you're on a smaller network, right? Then you have a less valuable product. You'd like it if everybody would switch all at the same time, but you don't want to be the first one who switches, right? So unless you can somehow coordinate, get some coordinated process by which everybody changes at the same time, no, no one person is going to have an incentive to change. Right? It's like, it's as if you live in the UK where everybody drives on the left-hand side of the road and you decide, you know, most other places in the world they drive on the right-hand side. There's probably some good reason for that. And then you can shift gears with your right hand instead of your left and most people are right-handed. And wouldn't it make more sense if we all, you know, drove on the right-hand side, had steering wheels on the left? I think I'll switch. And you start driving on the right-hand side of the road. Like, that probably wouldn't work so well, okay? Yeah, if everybody wants to switch at the same time, you know, midnight tonight, we all start driving on the right-hand side of the road, it might be okay. But, you know, there could, there could be some problems during the transition. Let's put it that way. Um, so what side of the road you drive on is an example of a path-dependent process. You do what people did before you and so on. And the idea is you might get stuck doing the wrong thing. Consuming a good or service that's not the best one, that doesn't satisfy consumer wants as well as some other product, but, but because of this uh, network effect, we've gotten stuck. We've gotten locked in to the wrong product, okay, by going down an inefficient path. Um, the, the most common examples that you see, the most famous example, alleged example of this phenomenon, is the QWERTY keyboard, right, the layout of the keys on the, uh, the arrangement of keys on a typical typewriter. How many of you have heard this QWERTY story before? Several of you have. Right, the idea is, you know, if you sort of look at a keyboard, it seems like a, you know, why not just A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Why is it this weird arrangement of letters? Well, the story goes, you know, in the early days of typing, um, there were many different, uh, you know, keyboard. There was no one standard keyboard layout. Uh, there were lots of different manufacturers of typewriters were experimenting with all different kinds of layouts. And as the story goes, as famously told by an economist named Paul David, uh, an economic historian at Stanford who made this story famous, Paul David, um, he said, well, if you look at the history of typing, here's what happened. There were all these different keyboards competing, and the QWERTY layout is really not that efficient. Um, there are other alternative layouts, one called Dvorak, for example. He says it's actually much ergonomically better. You can type faster and with fewer errors than on QWERTY. But, you know, there was, uh, in those early days, there were these sort of ty uh, typing contests. You know, the typewriter was new, and so typewriter manufacturers would roll into town. They would have a typing contest to try to generate uh, excitement for the product. And there was this one particular typist who happened to be really good, and he used QWERTY, but he just, just, just pure chance that he happened to use QWERTY. And he won a few of these typing contests. And so people mistakenly thought that QWERTY was really what was sort of a, a, a superior layout. So other people started to use QWERTY, and then the network effect kind of took over. Right? So because of this sort of random event of this guy winning these contests, um, all of a sudden more people began to use QWERTY, and the more people that already use QWERTY, the more likely you are to learn QWERTY than something else, because you want to you you be able to type on you know, as many different uh, keyboards as possible. So eventually we ended up where the standard keyboard layout is QWERTY, even though, according to Paul David, it's really an inferior layout. It's an inferior technology. Other examples, um, the VHS tape format. This is kind of, this example is rapidly becoming technologically obsolete. Um, some, of, some of you may not know what a VHS tape is, but before DVDs they had these little cassettes that you'd stick in. But actually even, even before that, um, when the video cassette recorder first came out in the 1970s, old timers in the room may remember this, there were two competing formats. There was VHS, which was made by Panasonic, and there was another format called Beta, or Betamax, that was made by Sony. It was a different, you know, they're both video cassettes, but the Beta technology was a little bit different. It had a higher resolution picture, and it was a smaller cassette. And so these, some of these historians have looked back and said, ah, this is the same thing, right? The Betamax, Sony's Betamax format was actually better than um, the VHS format, but you know, because of random uh, circumstances, VHS came to have a little bit slightly larger, a slightly larger user base than beta, so everybody else wanted to use VHS so they could, you know, play their tapes on other people's machines, and all of a sudden VHS dominated. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I guess, you'd go into the video rental store, 
And, you know, they had two, the big cassette and the little cassette for most movies. If you had a VHS recorder, you got one tape. If you had a beta recorder, you got the other tape. Eventually, beta disappeared. Um, how does this relate to Microsoft? Well, allegedly, the Microsoft platform, right, the old MS-DOS operating system that underlies Windows, is alleged to be another example of an inferior technology that won out due to the network effect. Right, so in the 1980s, when the personal computer really uh, uh, personal computer revolution sort of took off, there were lots of competing products. There was IBM's uh, products that ran on on Intel's platform, the Wintel combination running MS DOS. And some of you remember the might have if you've ever typed in the DOS window, you know, D I R, enter, and you get the uh, you get a directory listing before the mouse and the graphical user interface. Um, there was the MS-DOS platform. There were lots of other command line operating systems, Unix and all of its flavors, plus other desktop PC operating systems, Dr. DOS, and a whole bunch of others that are long forgotten. And then, of course, Apple comes along with the Macintosh, graphical user interface and the mouse in 1984, first commercial, widely available commercial product with Windows and a mouse and double-clicking on things. The argument is the same argument. Well, you know, DOS, Microsoft's product is really not a very good product. Um, the rival products are much better. You know, the Macintosh operating system is much more efficient, much more effective, much more sophisticated than MS-DOS. Yet, because of the network effect, the Macintosh never really could get a toehold in the market. Right? Because in the, er in, the, in the days of early adoption, you didn't want to, if you had a Mac, you pretty much had the only Mac on the block. You couldn't exchange floppy disks with other people. Other people wouldn't know how to use your computer. You wouldn't know how to use theirs and so on. So because everybody else was using an MS-DOS-based machine, I would choose to purchase an MS-DOS-based machine too. And eventually Microsoft grows to have this huge market share. Right, so this basic underlying economic argument, the, 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 the problem, the alleged market failure, according to these critics, is that when in, in, in technology markets, it's very common for the wrong product to win out. Okay, consumer sovereignty, as Mises described it, is violated. Consumers don't get the product they really want, the product that's really the best product. They get stuck with the wrong product because of these network effects. Okay, um, you know, what can we say about this argument? Well, there, there are many things wrong with it. Let me go through some of the problems with this argument um, one at a time. Okay, first of all, knowledge is not perfect. Okay, knowledge is not perfect. Um, the fact that, you know, we may, at some point, we may look around and say, well, gosh, we have the QWERTY keyboard and we have Microsoft Windows. You know, if we'd known, if I'd known 20 years ago, or if we as market participants had known 20 years ago that, um, you know, that, that DOS was going to be less efficient than Mac, we would have all used you know, we would have switched to Macs back then. You know, but we didn't. We're, you know, we're sorry. Right? That doesn't imply that the decision you made at the time was wrong. Okay, ex post regret doesn't mean that the decision you made when you made the decision using the information you had was, was an error. Okay, I mean, we always have to, pr we look forward into an uncertain future to try to predict, you know, the effect of our current choices on future outcomes, but we can never do that with certainty. Right? We make the decisions that we uh, do based on the information that we have. So the mere fact that some historian can look back and say, gosh, if only the market had chosen beta instead of VHS, we'd be so much better off. Even if that were true, which I'm not saying it is, but even if that were true, that wouldn't prove that the market messed up, Okay, that the market failed somehow, and that it doesn't imp imply that there's any feasible alternative that could have done better. Right? I mean, we're all fallible human beings with imperfect knowledge. It doesn't really imply anything interesting. Um, furthermore, right, a, 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 a key to this argument is, this idea, is the idea that it's, hard to, that it's costly to switch, that if you've been trained to type on QWERTY, you can't just start using some other keyboard. You won't be able to type as fast. Well, but look, if, if you include the cost of switching as a cost of using an alternative technology, then the technology you're currently using may be the most efficient one. Right? The fact that it's costly to switch from QWERTY to Dvorak, I should write that down. Uh -um.
the fact that it's costly to switch to the Dvorak keyboard or some other keyboard, well, that's a cost of Dvorak, right? Once you include the switching cost, the technology that we're currently using, in a meaningful sense, is the best technology. Okay, so it doesn't imply, there's any, doesn't imply any market failure. Okay, furthermore, um, it's not always the case that everybody has to switch at the same time, as in my driving on the right-hand side versus the left-hand side example. You see this a lot in the arguments about Microsoft, right? And the argument goes something like the following. Well, uh, there is a sort of a synergy between uh, the operating system and the applications that run on top of it. So Microsoft, because Microsoft has such a dominant position in op the operating systems market, right, it also is able to use that, it leverages that, that dominant position to gain a similarly dominant position in the market for you know, desktop applications, word processing, for example. Right? That uh, uh, everybody uses Word because it in, you know, integrates nicely with Windows. And the idea is, well, um, you know, no, uh, ri let's say I want to create an, a, a rival operating system, you know, the Klein OS. Okay, the claim is, well, no, nobody could profitably produce a Klein OS because no one would buy my operating system unless they could get a version of Word or Excel or whatever to go on it. Right? They would want word processing and spreadsheet and database applications and a browser and so on that would go on my operating system. So no one would buy my operating system unless they can also get applications to run on my operating system. But no, one is, would be, no, no producer would be willing to write applications to run on my operating system unless I have any customers. It, so it's kind of a catch-22 chicken and egg. I can't get anybody to use my operating system without applications, but I can't get anyone to write any applications for me until people are using my operating system. So you know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck. No one can get into that market, so-called applications barrier to entry that gives Microsoft an unfair advantage. The um, problem with this argument is that it isn't necessary it isn't the case that the only way you can compete with the incumbent is by offering exactly the same product the incumbent offers. Okay, so that argument that I just gave is true as far as it goes, right? I probably couldn't write a Klein OS that is, you know, an almost perfect substitute for Windows, a full-fledged operating system that does everything that you know Windows XP Pro is designed to do, um, because I, I wouldn't have programs to run on it. Right, but that doesn't mean that I can't compete with Microsoft in a small, incremental way. In other words, if we apply the concept of marginal analysis, right, it might be the case that there are some specialized applications for which I can design an operating system. You know, some kind of server maintenance, or maybe there's a, a specialized set of users, you know, eccentric people like artists. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we have any Macintosh people in the group. I won't ask you to identify yourselves to spare you the embarrassment. But as you know, you know, artsy people, yeah, artsy people almost always use Macs. You know, graphic designers, architects, those kinds of people, right? They almost always use Macs. There's, I don't know why. Um, they can't figure out how to use the right mouse button somehow. But I'm kidding. Um, the point is, right? There might be some specialized segment of the market for which I could design a Klein OS. It wouldn't try to do everything that Windows does, but it would try to do some small specialized task and do it really well. Right? And so I might attract a few customers. Yeah, I wouldn't get half of Microsoft's customers, but I might get a few, enough to make it viable or profitable for, for an application, for a programmer to write a small application for me. So I can have a small operating system with small applications that run on it, that appeals to a small group of people, right? And maybe if I'm successful, other people see what I've done, they adopt that same technology. Eventually, I could grow incrementally to where I could compete with a larger player like Microsoft. It doesn't have to happen all at once. This idea that my, no one can compete with Microsoft unless they can compete head-to-head, -head, you know, in a battle of giants, is just silly. You can always have competition that's sort of nibbling around the edges. That's still, com that's still competition. Okay. Um, one, two, three, fourth problem with the QWERTY argument is even if, you bu even if you bought it, even if you said, gosh, you're right, the market sure does make these mistakes. That's, all, that's awful. The market does choose inferior technologies. You know, what would you do about it? Right? It's like, uh, it's like my grandmother used to say, getting old isn't so bad once you consider the alternative. 
Okay. The alternative to allowing the market to choose technological standards would be what? To have the government do it? So you'd have some, some government-appointed body of experts or some bureaucrats who decide we're all going to use QWERTY or we're all going to use Dvorak. Or let's see, uh, the Macintosh is better. We, hear, we issue a decree by which everyone must use, Microsoft, uh, must use the Mac platform. Okay. I mean, look, it, if we know anything about how politicized decision-making, if we know anything about politicized decision-making, we know how the political process works. Right? We can, it's easy to see that the decisions made by a government-appointed body are likely to be far worse than the decisions that a market makes. Right? I mean, what, what, what body of experts, what body of government officials could have, could have chosen the optimal technologies any better than the market? Okay, so this is sort of a silly argument. Even if you bought this whole story, um, it wouldn't imply that there's anything you can do about it. It certainly, it certainly, wouldn't, be, it certainly wouldn't show that government intervention fixes the problem or makes it better. We might be likely to make it far worse. But fortunately, we don't even have to accept the premise of the argument because it's wrong. Okay, for one thing, it's historically wrong. All of the examples that have been offered in the literature of these network effects or QWERTY effects or inefficient paths all turn out to be wrong on closer inspection. Uh, the, the, the authors who have done the, 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 the brilliant work on this are two economists named Leibowitz and Margolis, Stan Leibowitz and Stephen Margolis, written a series of articles debunking these historical myths about, uh, about QWERTY and, and, and VHS and Microsoft. Um, uh, their uh, first article uh, came out in 1990 called The Fable of the Keys. It's a, it's a pun on Bernard Mandeville's book, The Fable of the Bees. But uh, it was a, history, a revisionist history of the QWERTY keyboard story. And they have a couple of books and a series of articles where they look at these examples. What they did in the QWERTY case is they said, well, if you look back at the historical record, if you look more closely at the history of typing, the, the, the sort of small, stylized version told by Paul David, the critic of QWERTY, is, does, doesn't, is, is completely wrong, right? That it's true that there, were, there was a typing contest, but in fact there were lots of typing contests in the early days, and QWERTY won a lot of them. A lot of different typists using QWERTY uh, won, won the contest, not all of them, but many of them. It turns out that um, you know, sort of modern uh, you know, the people who study ergonomics have found that really any keyboard layout is just about as good as any other keyboard layout. Um, what really makes, what leads to skilled typing is repetition, right? So somebody who can type fast on QWERTY, you, if, you know, it takes a couple of days to retrain them onto Dvorak, but then they can type just as fast on Dvorak as QWERTY, but no faster. Right? It really doesn't matter what keyboard you use as long as you use the same one. Um, so QWERTY is just as good as any other keyboard. It turns out that the, the, the documents that, that David had relied on to show that Dvorak was superior to QWERTY it was based on a Navy study done in the 1950s that allegedly showed that typists were more productive uh, on the alternative keyboard. turned out that that study had been written by Mr. Dvorak himself, the guy who invented this alternate keyboard. So there's no evidence that QWERTY is worse than any other layout. Um, right, I mean, another argument you could make is, well, gosh, if, if QWERTY is really so bad, um, it wouldn't be that hard to switch. Even if you say, well, for an even if you say, well, individuals don't want to switch, because then they'll be the only one using a weird keyboard, and they won't be able to use anybody else's computer. But even that argument isn't totally strong, because obviously it just takes um, a little bit of software to change a keyboard. Now uh, it's much easier than it was in the old days of typewriters. You can you can make your keyboard a Dvorak keyboard with a couple of mouse clicks on most operating systems, by the way. But right, if Dvorak were really superior. Then think of companies uh, that, that employ large secretarial pools, right? Even in the early days of typing, the 30s, the 40s, you had these companies that employed, you know, hundreds of typists. Um, why, if there were really these great productivity gains to be had from switching to Dvorak, why is it we don't know? We can't. We don't know any examples of any company that switched from QWERTY to something else. Right? And they could fully internalize the network effect by ordering all 500 typists to switch at the same time. Right? So the network effect, the network externality, can be internalized through collective decision making like in a company. Right? But we don't know any historical examples of a group of typists switching to another 
keyboard layout. And if, if QWERTY is really all that bad, then the productivity gains from switching would be huge. Right? Even if, you, even if it takes a few days to retrain people, so what? That's a short-term cost. Be a huge long-term gain, but we never saw any of that gain. Right? With VHS and beta, same thing. There's a confusion in this literature often between uh, what we might call technological superiority and what we might call economic <coughs> superiority. So a lot of the critics who like to say, well, beta is, was really much better than VHS, what they mean better in a kind of a geeky sense. Okay? I mean, right, the beta cassette it was smaller. You know, that's cool. I mean, it had a higher resolution picture. But it turns out that cassettes were much more expensive. Uh, the recorders are more expensive, and the beta tapes could only hold 30 minutes worth of material, whereas the VHS tapes could hold two hours, right now, you know, six hours in the slow mode. And so, you know, consumers, when choosing between, you know, the technologically more advanced product that can only record for 30 minutes and the less advanced product that can record for two hours, consumers preferred the one that could record for two hours. Right? Consumers thought that the value of the longer recording time w exceeded the value of the crisper resolution. They didn't, they didn't need the level of quality that beta, beta provided. So the point is, just because one product from an engineering point of view is superior to another doesn't mean that from an economic point of view it is, in terms of you know, ability to satisfy consumer wants. You see the same thing with uh, uh, MS-DOS and the Macintosh. Right? Uh, Probably no one, uh, I don't, probably none of you remember or are old enough to have used one of the early Macs. But I remember I was in college in 1984, and one of my, somebody in my dorm got a Macintosh. And we all gathered around it. It was really cool. And, you know, of course, they had a little tiny screen, but these windows and the mouse, we didn't know what a mouse was, you know. It was, it was kind of a neat toy, but it didn't work all that well. I mean, it wasn't very useful for doing the kinds of things that people did in those days. Right, this was before the web. Most, what most people used their computers for in those days was word processing and spreadsheet. Okay. And the Mac was incredibly slow. Um, it was very expensive. Um, you know, for doing the kinds of things that people typically did with computers in those days, the MS-DOS platform actually worked a lot better. It was a lot faster. It was a lot more reliable. Um, it was easier to use. Um, so sure, I mean, from a programming point of view, from an aesthetic point of view, the, the, the Mac, Macintosh operating system was better. But from an economic point of view, from the user's point of view, the point of view of the typical user, it wasn't better. Okay, so all these examples, alleged examples of where the wrong, uh, where the wrong technology won out, uh, are very flimsy. Right? The arguments are very flimsy because there's no evidence that the technology that did win out really is the wrong one. Okay? When we take all of these factors into consideration, even including the network effects, there's no evidence that what wins out is sort of the wrong technology. Okay. Um, let me switch gears for a minute and talk about um, internet technology very briefly. Then I'll mention a few other issues and, and throw it open for questions. Um, the internet uh, is uh, sort of very uh, interesting thing to study. A lot of uh, economists the last five, ten years, when the internet really, you know, when, the, the, when the commercial internet began to flourish, the, really the mid to late 1990s, uh, there was a lot of analysis of how it worked, and is, is it like a market, uh, is the internet a spontaneous order, and so on. You had a lot of uh, Austrian economists using the example of the internet to show that, well, you know, here's what happens when the government keeps its hands off. You have something... Um, you know, you have this marvelous technology that sort of emerges, and you have uh, people can communicate with each other, and they can share information. This is a perfect example of what happens when the government gets out of the way. Um, I want to give you a little bit of caution in that story. There's a grain of truth in it, but it's not completely true because it's not the case that the government wasn't involved. I mean, the government was heavily involved in the creation of what we now call the Internet. Now, I don't say that in a good sense. You know, you, there's a famous uh, example of Al Gore, you know, claiming credit for having invented the Internet. Uh, there's some bureaucrats who say, well, look, the Internet is so great, and this just proves why you need a powerful, you know, strong central state to, to create these technologies. And then a lot of free market 
uh, a lot of libertarians argue against that and say, no, 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 the government, you know, the, what the government did really didn't, wasn't all that important. It was how the market took it over after that. Um, both are true. Um, I think the government did have a, a very strong role that has been underappreciated by a lot of uh, free market enthusiasts, but not for the good, okay? The government's intervention is not necessarily beneficial. Let me just explain briefly what I mean. Um, as many of you know, the commercial internet has its origins in a government technology, a military technology that was called, called the ARPANET, um, which was developed in the 1960s as a way for military bases to communicate with each other. Right? You know that uh, the, 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 the geeky types among you know that internet, uh, internet communication is based on a technology called TCP/IP, Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol. You've probably seen sometimes if you're, you can't connect to the internet on your computer, you have to adjust your TCP IP settings. You have to know what your IP address is. That's what this refers to. Um, TCP is a t technology called packet switching. What that means is when, um, when you transmit information in an email or you download a page from the web, that information is broken down into little chunks called packets. And the little chunks travel through the internet independently, right? So if you think about the way the internet works, right, you have all these different computers connected to these other computers. When computer A sends information to computer B, it's not like there's a single, you know, phone line that goes from a single, uh, you know, trunk line going from A to B. In fact, it's a sort of a decentralized web of different connection points. Right, so this, you know, you send your email to this server and then it sends a packet to this server, to this server, to this server, to this server, and eventually it gets over here. And your email message is broken down into multiple packets and the packets could take different routes to get to their destination. And then once they all arrive at computer B, they're reassembled into your original message and then delivered to the recipient. Right, the reason for that technology is because the designers are trying to figure out, you know, well, how do we set up a secure and safe and reliable network that, you know, can't be taken out by a nuclear bomb, right? So a traditional means of communication, you know, person A calls person B on the phone, and they have a dedicated line, you know, a dedicated connection just between their two devices. That is, well, if you have sort of a single path like that, then, you know, the the commies drop a bomb right in the middle, and it, and it severs the line, and then this, this person can't communicate with this person. Well, if we have this sort of decentralized web, and we break the information down and let it travel all these different routes, there's no one central part of the network that can be taken out. Right? So there's, if, if, if a bomb destroys one line, the packets can just sort of travel around it, and they can get to their destination anyway. Right? So this is a very deliberate, purposeful design an attempt to create a means of communication in the event of a nuclear war. Okay. What happened is um, the, uh, uh, the uh, design proved to be very useful for other applications as well, for research applications. And so researchers in the uh, Pentagon, at the RAND Corporation, uh, and some universities began using it for other, you know, for non-military purposes, for research purposes. Right, the fact that um, you could communicate in this decentralized way made, makes for a very efficient use of the resources that you have. Right, the problem with the traditional single line from point A to point B, right, if you think about a phone conversation, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you know, while you're, for the duration of your call, no one else can break in on that line. Right, so even if you have long, awkward pauses in your conversation, long moments of silence, during those periods, that line is unused, right? No one else can use it, even if they would like to. With a packet switching network, where all the information is broken up into packets, you can sort of send all the packets, you know, down a, they can go down thinner wires, and the wire, so to speak, and the wires are, are you, make, you make better use of the capacity that you have, because the packets can share, packets from different conversations can share the same wire, um, that's the way the so-called VOIP, voice over IP, works. Um, it, you know, making phone calls over the net. Um, it, it, you don't have to have as much wiring, so to speak, as many diff as many paths, because the packets can share the same path. Um, so people began using it. Researchers began using it to send personal messages. 
to remotely log in to distant computers to run programs and so on. Um, somebody said, uh, where's the quotation? Um, I can't find the, the quote. I had a quote from somebody. I uh, said that, you know, quickly the, uh, the uh, ARPANET became not so much a military project, but a, a high-speed, federally subsidized post office, okay, for researchers to send little personal notes back and forth. Right, and eventually, some commercial applications were developed, and civilian use, civilian users kind of piggybacked onto the original network, and it kind of metamorphosized into the Internet that we have today. Okay, well, I mean, so what? Who cares? Why, why does it matter that this technology that we have today and that we use for private purposes has a military origin. Okay. Well, it turns out that the origin of the Internet, the specific design, the specific purpose for which it was designed, has important implications for how it works for us today. Okay. It turns out that packet switching is a very good technology for some applications, but it's not the optimal technology for some other applications. Right, applications that do not require a real-time connection, you know, email, um, web browsing, um, remotely logging into other computers and so on, um, transferring files back and forth. You know, if there's a, a, f a brief delay of a few seconds while there's some congestion uh, on a particular line, it's no big deal. Right, but for real-time applications, streaming audio, streaming video, voice over IP, um, packet switching may not actually be the right, may not be the optimal technology. Right, and the problem with the, uh, uh, the the architecture of the net today is it's think of it this way: it's a very egalitarian architecture. So if there are five people over here sending emails to to recipients over here, all the emails are broken down into packets, and all the packets are thrown into the network and they work their way through. Well, what if one person's email is a lot more important than somebody else's email? Okay, so here's you know some. Uh, uh, you know, cancer researcher is cancer scientist is sending a piece of vital information to the surgeon down here who's going to operate on this patient, and it's a life or death situation. You know, over here is you know some college student and he's you know he's emailing a MP3 file to his friend. Okay, the 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 the, the surgeon's message may get delayed because the college student's MP3 file is sort of hogging the line. Um, there's no way to prioritize the packets. <coughs> There's no way to price them, for example, and say, well, you know, uh, I'm willing to pay $10 to send my message through. Oh, I'm only willing to pay a dollar to send mine through, so let the $10 message go through first. Okay? There's no way to allocate the resource according to willingness to pay. It's, what's so called, sometimes it's an example of what's sometimes called the tragedy of the commons, because the resource is underpriced. It tends to be overutilized or inefficiently utilized. Right? Could, could there be some alternative architecture, some alternative to TCP/IP that would allow packets to be priced, right? That would allow larger chunks to go through uh, to permit, uh, facilitate, or improve real-time applications. Is TCP/IP the right technology? Is it the most efficient technology? Well, we don't know, right? We don't know because that it's not the, a technology that emerged and a decentralized fashion on the market. It was a technology that was designed by government officials to achieve a certain purpose. Um, you know, of course it's true that, I mean, no, I'm certainly not knocking the internet, right? I mean, none of us could live without it. Um, but we can, we can marvel at the internet, we can admire, um, you know, the great accomplishments uh, that uh, the internet pioneers uh, achieved, but, but we have to be wary of the broken window fallacy. Why? We have to be careful not to commit Hazlitt's broken window fallacy. You, you all know what that is, right? right? The fact that the Internet that we use today has all these wonderful features doesn't mean that it's more efficient than some alternative Internet that might have emerged under different circumstances. Okay? We don't know what the market would have chosen if the market could have free, freely chosen its own network uh, protocols. Let me show you a quote from... Uh, um, a, a document that circulates around called the Netbook. It's sort of an open source history of the internet. Um, and it's a very telling quotation. Um, the authors say, um, the current global computer network, the internet, has been developed by scientists and researchers and users who were free of market forces 
Because of the government oversight and subsidy of network development, these network pioneers were not under the time pressures or bottom line restraints that dominate commercial ventures. Therefore, they could contribute the time and labor needed to make sure the problems were solved. In other words, you know, the, the original designers of the network were free for the, from the constraint that they had to produce something that consumers wanted. Okay? They were massively subsidized and could work, come up with whatever solutions they thought were technologically the most you know, nifty. Um, whether or not they were optimal or desirable uh, or the best technologies for satisfying consumer wants. That's something to keep in mind. Um, <coughs> what about open source? There's another issue that comes up in, in our circles. There's some people who say, well, open, open source software is sort of, that's an example of market-based software, and, and whereas, you know, the sort of traditional model, top-down programming models are hierarchical, they're like central planning, so Austrians should favor open source. This is, this is silly, this is a silly argument. Um, you know, is, you know, which is the better technology for designing, you know, a word processing program or an operating system, open source like Linux, or the traditional proprietary model like you know, Windows XP? Well, who the heck knows? I mean, there's no way to answer that question ex ante. It's kind of like the problem we talked about on Monday of, you know, what's the optimal firm size, big or small? Well, economic theory doesn't give us an answer to that question, right? There are advantages to making firms larger, organizing activities inside the firm. There are, there are disadvantages as well. Right? And market participants have to weigh these costs and benefits at the margin. Uh, there are advantages to relying on open source, the open source model, you know, allowing lots of different people to contribute. But there are drawbacks as well in terms of the loss of some central coordination. Um, there, we can't say what combination of open source versus traditional programming the market. Right? So the market is free to choose whatever combination it wants, and there's certainly no, you know, to, to call the traditional way of writing software central planning is like saying that all you know large firms are bad because they represent central planning. Um, so that argument isn't true. There's lots of interesting historical examples too, or real world examples of open source projects that fail. Um, open source sometimes works well, sometimes it doesn't. Now, finally, just a few words briefly about intellectual property. Um, this, this issue came up in the question and answer panel last night in the, the, the micro panel. Some of you heard a little bit of this yesterday. Um, it's important in, in, in markets for information, in the economics of information technology. Um, you know, what's the appropriate policy for providing IP protection, uh, patents, copyrights, and so on? Are patents and copyrights legitimate? Are, uh, is intellectual property a legitimate form of property that deserves legal protection? Um, there's some disagreement in the literature on this point. Uh, Murray Rothbard made the case that he thought patents were illegitimate, um, but copyrights were, le were legitimate, that, um, it, that uh, people should be able to own sort of the creative expression of a particular idea, like a song or a, 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 a book or whatever, uh, that, that, that protecting those by copyright was legitimate that copying somebody else's song without attribution was a violation of the writer's property rights. Um, but but uh, uh, production processes or technologies uh, should not be, uh, should not be uh, legitimately legally protected. So, um, you know, if I invent a technology for, you know, producing a lamp, um, that I should not be able to prevent other people from producing lamps using the same technology. Right now, if they stole it from me by stole, stealing, we mean they broke into my laboratory and you know took my blueprints out of the safe. That's an easy case, right? That's trespass. They violated my property rights by trespassing on my building. But if they came up with the idea themselves or they just heard about it and they produced the same thing, there was nothing wrong with that. Um, more recently, um, a, a, a legal scholar named Stefan Kinsella has written some pieces arguing that Rothbard got it wrong, that, um, that neither patents nor copyrights uh, re represent legitimate forms of legal protection. That, um, so, you know, as this goes to sort of the digital, you know, the downloadable music debate, is it okay to, are, are you violating someone else's property rights when you download a song um, without paying the creator? Um, you know, the tr traditional argument has been, yes, the, you're depriving the creator of the fruits of his labor, 
Um, there's kind of, I guess there's a, there's, there's a, a rights-based and a utilitarian argument. The rights-based argument is, is not fair? You know, if I, I create, I wrote that song, I performed it, it was recorded, you know, it, I own it. You shouldn't be able to play that on your computer or copy it or whatever. That's a violation of my rights. The utilitarian argument is, if we didn't have copyrights on songs and video, if we allowed people to freely distribute music over the internet, then artists wouldn't have an incentive to create art. There wouldn't be enough art. There wouldn't be enough songs ri uh, written or recorded or movies produced or whatever. Um, and Gonzalez shows quite well, I think, that both of those arguments are flawed, that it's not a violation of someone else's property rights to have your own digital copy of their digital information. It doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't, it doesn't violate their physical property rights, nor, uh, nor is it the case that you wouldn't have innovation or you would have insufficient innovation um, if you took away copyrights. Um, I mean, it, because we know that if the government subsidized something, something we get more of it. That doesn't mean that if somebody says, oh, if we take away the subsidy, we'll have less of that thing. That's horrible. Well, maybe we sh should have less of it, right? Um, so and we, we can say more about that if you want. Um, oh, I guess I'm about out of time. So to conclude, um, Right. I, I think the point that there are some interesting sort of structural features of the digital economy is a perfectly good point. Those features can be studied and analyzed. They're interesting. But they don't really imply market failure or some, you know, re require some kind of government response. The basic laws of economics still apply. So I don't know. If, I guess we have like minus two minutes for questions if anybody wants to ask one. <laughs> Thornton's not in here to kick us out, so. I guess I just have a quick question about the, you're talking about how people could invest and have a better internet, essentially, that, you know, is already set up by the government. In a sense, you had mentioned, you know, the, the cancer surgeon needing to spend $10 to get it to them faster. There are the different applications that the private industry has come up with, with broadband, with T1, with T2, and all the different ways which cost right. more money. You know, you can buy AOL for $15 right. a month, or you can buy T1 right. for however much it costs you to set up your right. server, so in a sense, has that. No, you're certainly right that you can, right, you can pay more for higher connection speed, but the point is just because I, look, I mean, that's, that's the speed between your, the computer in your house or in your office and the nearest, you know, backbone line. But once you get on that backbone line, you're sharing it with everyone else. So when I use dial-up, slow dial-up, it's, it's slow between my computer and the next point in the network. But then it goes on a T1 line anyway, on a backbone line. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. I get better performance for me yeah. by paying more for a speedier connection to the Internet. But that doesn't change the fact that the packets on the Internet are all sort of jumbled together. <coughs> okay, well, thanks a lot.